Good morning, everybody. Today I'll do a Sunday. It's a Sunday, and uh, when I make the videos on the day, I post them on the blog. It'll say Made Today, or on Facebook, it'll say Made Today. I don't really need to give the date because I'm, I'm not going to use the Catholic Masses, and oftentimes to teach on the verses from the Catholic Mass. So I normally give the date because that will be the date of the verses and people can go back and look and see what we taught on. And I do that for the benefit of just all Christians, meaning it's just an outline that I use, but it, it's explaining, trying to teach the verses that a lot of Christians happen to hear on a Sunday. But this week, I'll do a few little notes. I think it's been a few weeks since I spoke. Um, the other day as I was doing some work, and then I'll get to the what I want to teach, I realized as I was working on my websites and videos that I had like a whole year of missing, missing videos because I never videotaped. And it was a process that I just, you know, started doing one day and then I started making a lot of videos. And for one year, almost a full year I did like home groups but all over South Texas and I would take some of my homeless friends to Kingsville and then to Bishop then we went to city of Alice and once a month we went to San Antonio with the brother of one of my homeless friends who lived moved to San Antonio and it was interesting because I always took a few guys with me and there'd be people waiting for us and so those were a lot of good meetings and I realized, oh, I didn't videotape. I might have got one or two that you'll see that I did at a little halfway house. And so I felt, oh, that's, you know, hopefully the seed that was planted, you know, went forth. But as I was thinking of that, I remembered, I, I wasn't going to try to remember all of the studies and redo them. It would be hard to do. And then ones I didn't videotape. But I remembered one. And a pastor friend of mine by the name of Ray Escalante, who does a homeless ministry for many years where I live in Corpus Christi, he invited me to speak at like an open air meeting where they would set up a big tent, feed the, the name of his ministry is Church Without Walls. And so what I remembered was that message out of, you know, all the different ones. And I normally don't prepare a specific message, but there were a few points on that Sunday that I wanted to hit on, and that came to my mind. And so as I was looking at maybe doing the Catholic Masses today versus, I thought, no, and I quickly, you know, referenced a few verses. But what I want to teach on is Adam and how in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul refers to Jesus as the last Adam. And so Paul will make contrasts of the first Adam, which we know in Genesis account, the first man that God created. And then we, I want to look at how Jesus is referred to as the last Adam, and maybe some insights from the creation account that teach us about redemption. Now let me see if there are any more notes I wanted to hit on. There's one, but I, it might take a little too long. In the Genesis account of creation, God makes man, and God puts man in a garden, and God gives Adam one restriction, and that one restriction is, in this wonderful garden and presence of God, the Garden of Eden, there were many trees. Now, there were only two trees that had names, which were referred to as the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when God puts man in this environment of his presence, he gives one restriction. And he says, of all these wonderful trees you can eat of, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. To Adam, he gives the instruction, in the day you eat of it, that day you will die. If you disobey my word, and you partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Now, God creates Eve, and we read the account of, puts Adam into a deep sleep, this is Genesis 2 and 3, and takes forth a rib, and 
makes a woman. She comes out from man, and that's Eve. And then we read the fateful day of the temptation in the garden. And Satan, ser the serpent, would come to Eve, and he would guile, trick, deceiver. Jesus calls him the father of lies in John's Gospel. And he comes and tempts Eve and says, Did God not allow you to eat from all the trees of the garden? Meaning, right off the bat, he's saying, God is withholding something from you. He's put a restriction on you. And that restriction is not to your benefit, Eve. But that restriction, by God saying, Don't eat from a particular tree, really is God does not want you to eat of it because in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, you will be as God's. You will know good and evil. And, it, and she looks on this tree, and it's a tree to be, we see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life that uh, 1 John speaks about, all that is in the world. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So the will of God in this particular case for Eve was don't touch, don't eat of the tree. And she responds to Satan, to the serpent, and says, yes, we were put in this garden, but God put this restriction. Now what happens in the account of the fall of man, which we refer to as original sin, it says Eve decides to disobey God, the voice of God, and she listens to the enemy at that point, and it says she takes of that fruit from the forbidden tree. Okay, we understand that we don't know what particular type of a fruit we can refer to, but there's meaning in what God is showing us in this account. And so she takes it and eats. And then there's one verse, I think it's Genesis 3.6, and it says, she gave to her husband, and he did eat. And then we'll try to get back to that as I quote a few more uh, verses. Because that's what we want to look at. What do we see in that act, in that particular act? The original sin, which is a biblical doctrine that Paul teaches in the book of Romans, and throughout Christian history, um, some influential people, a man by the name of Pelagius, a bishop in, I guess, the 4th century, and we refer to his teaching as Pelagianism, and this man had denied original sin. He said that what took place at that day had really had no effect on other people after, but yet the Apostle Paul in Romans, uh, we'll get to Romans 5, in Romans 5 is one of the chapters where Paul speaks about the first Adam and the last Adam. And by the disobedience of one man, when Adam ate, many became sinners. So by the obedience of one man shall many become righteous. And it speaks about the last Adam, Christ, and the first Adam. And so what Jesus Christ has done for us, he was sinless. He never sinned. He was obedient to the Father. And because of that, it put him in the position to bear the sins of you and I, to die for the sins of the world. And that penalty that God had pronounced on that day, the day that you eat of it, the day that you sin, you will surely die. That penalty, says Paul again in Romans, says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what the Bible teaches us in the gospel, it says there's a penalty for sin. So men are separated from God. And all of the works and the good works, which are indeed important in the Christian life, James speaks of that in his letter, the one letter in the New Testament, but the works of men, trying to get back to God. Don't cut it, because the penalty for sin is death. And indeed, when men come to God 
and are born of God and believe in Christ and confess Jesus as Lord, there will be a change in them and they will be good. God will perform that work in them. But the penalty of sin, which is death, man can't pay that. Or if man dies apart from God, never believing in Christ, never receiving the grace, it says in Romans 5, those that receive this gift of grace. And Paul compares the original act of disobedience of Adam and says, but God turned that around and he took the obedience of Christ going to the cross, never sinning and going to the cross and dying for us, and that turned it around so there were many acts of sin and this one act of Christ dying for that sin turned that around. And so Paul compares the act of Adam as passing on original sin to humanity and the one act of Jesus at the cross. He died, was buried, and rose again on the third day in fulfillment of the scriptures. That it turned that around for those that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of life. And all of the spiritualities of these our days and people that say it's interesting to you know, delve into the realm of spiritual things and all the various religions and things that are espoused. What is often left out is the need for redemption because it sort of appeals to a religious nature of man to just want to have maybe a spirituality, a religious type of thing. And, it, and, and so far as that is people that are beginning to seek God it's good that they're looking for something more. But you can't bypass the cross. You can't bypass the message of Christ. That There is no other way. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. There is one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. So because of what we know from Scripture, we understand that the only way, if you will, to get back to the garden is through the cross, is through Christ. Now, the tree of life, which was mentioned in Genesis, was showing us we have life and the presence of God is long before sin took place. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, indeed, there was an aspect, if you read the rest of Genesis 3, there was a stage of innocence that was lost, and there was an aspect, if you will, of their eyes being open to good and evil. But the lie of the enemy to Eve was, you shall not surely die. And that was a lie. That was the deceiver lying. Because indeed, they were sent out from the garden. And there's this angel with the sword that it says protected. So the people, Adam and Eve, mankind, could not access that tree of life in that fallen state. I've always felt that this also speaks to us of the story in the whole Old Testament coming into the New Testament of law versus grace. And I believe the trees also speak about uh, greater spiritual truths. And in the New Testament, the law and the law covenant, which had it served a purpose, had a purpose in time. But that law covenant could not save people. And Paul will say, I guess in uh, Galatians, if there had been a law given that could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. But through the law is the knowledge of good and evil. And that's what we see in that tree, if you will, of the knowledge of good and evil. We, we see the attempt of man to say, I'll bypass the tree of life, or I will try to regulate my own life apart from the dictates of God, man in rebellion, and then I'll still have this life, but I'll be in my rebellious state. And all the law, all the truth and knowledge of good and evil could do, it could indeed show you what's good and what's bad. And the law indeed served that purpose, just showing us what was good and bad. And Paul will teach in Galatians and Romans, and that purpose of the law was to just reveal that to us. And that ultimately the tree of life, ultimately the cross, 
Christ, the man whose name is the branch, who will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. And there is a scripture that speaks about the tree, and we know it's the cross, that Christ was crucified. He that hangs on the tree, everyone that hangs on the tree is cursed. And meaning Christ on the cross hung on that place of curse for humanity. In Corinthians 15, Paul also speaks about, it's an interesting verse, but it says, Paul's talking about the resurrection body. The first man, Adam, was a living soul. And the last Adam was a quickening or a life-giving spirit. And then you go down in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, and the Lord is that spirit. So we see Paul in these, in Romans 5, Corinthians 15. There might be a few of this because I didn't really prepare that much for that. But what we see is Paul does indeed show us that there are comparisons from the first Adam to the last Adam. The act of disobedience plunged man into sin, and it was one act of obedience. Christ was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The crucifixion, that life, if you will, the tree of life. This is how we have access, apart from the law. Not that we are lawbreakers, but apart from the, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So we're in the new covenant, and by God's grace, we fulfill by nature the law. But we're not under that law. But it says in Galatians, and when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those that were under the law. And so there was a proper time and a proper place for the law, for the old covenant. And it just brought us to the time of Christ and that fullness of time in the first century. Now there's one interesting verse. It's 1 Timothy 2.14. And this is the one I remembered when I said I remember that one meeting I had that I'd never caught on video. And it's an insight from Paul. And it simply says, Adam was not deceived in the transgression, or was not tricked into doing what he did. But the woman was deceived. So Paul teaches us in the New Testament, which is the word of God in 1 Timothy 2.14, that when Adam did that act, you have to understand the environment they were in. They were in this presence of God. And God gave to Adam a mate, a help meet, someone, a companion. And so you see the original bridegroom and bride. You see Adam and Eve. And then something happens where the bride noticed the sin of partaking, which most of us are familiar with Eve eating of that fruit. It was an act that it like infected her. It was something that she took into herself. She partook and ate something. And that's a type of sin that it gets in humanity. And it's a disease, it's a poison, it kills, it destroys. And, and that's what the serpent, this Satan does. He, he's the father of lies, he comes to kill, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus comes that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And so we know Paul just told us in Timothy 1.14, 2.14, that Adam was not deceived. But what does that mean he was not deceived? We know he sinned, which is the original sin. And we know that when she handed that fruit from the forbidden tree to Adam, that he ate too. And they were both banished from the presence of God, kicked out of the garden. But if he was not deceived, where's the, what's the difference there? Eve did indeed believe the lie of the serpent. She was tricked. She believed the lies that he told her, 
that in the day you eat, you will not die. She believed she fell for those temptations. The, it, the tree looked good. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was a temptation. And, and she was tricked. Now, Adam knew that there would be a penalty for what he was going to do. But he had a choice. And the choice was, I can remain in the presence of God until my wonderful bride, I'm not going to do it. Now, of course, I'm just giving a scenario here because we understand that these things all happen for purposes. But if he did not partake that day of the fruit that the wife is handing to him, he could have stayed in the presence of God, but he would have been without the bride. And so what he does, knowingly, eyes wide open, he then consumes, he says, I'm going to take this thing that has infected my bride. She has it in her now. This act of disobedience shown to us through the eating from that something in her. He says, I'm going to drink this into me. I'm going to, cons I'm going to put it in me too, Eve. And I know that when I eat of this, and I put this thing in me, this sin, I will be separated from my God and my Father. But it is the only way that I can continue to be with my bride. And I think we see a type of Christ, the last Adam, even in that. Now, Adam did that out of disobedience. But the thing that he did was he consumed the fruit, he allowed that which was infecting his bride to come into him. And he did it knowing what was going to happen. And in the New Testament, when Jesus is praying, we read in Isaiah 53 that he was made sin for us, the New Testament. He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, we like sheep, as I say, fifth three, gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then he prays in the garden. He prays in agony. Great drops of blood. If this cup, Father, can pass for me, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. And some Christians debated. Obviously, Jesus was not afraid of the act of death. But he was never forsaken from the fall. You know, at the time Adam ate, he was never out of the presence of God until that moment that he chose to put that in him. That would be the day that they would die spiritually and ultimately they die physically. And so the debate that we see in the agony of Christ is knowing that for the first time, if he took this thing, if he drank of this cup, if he put the sin of humanity in him, he would for the first time be forsaken from the Father for you and I. And never, never having experienced separation from God and being perfect, he did it for the bride. He did it for the bride for you and I, for the church. There was something that infected people called sin. And the only solution to that was if Christ, which the scripture says is the bridegroom, he gave himself for the church that he made sanctified and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So eyes wide open, and he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, he understood. But the act of being separated from the fallen, which he never experienced, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Always with the Father. Never a time when he was not with the Father. And then he eats, and he becomes sin for us. And all who receive that grace come back into the presence of the Father. 
And the difference between the two acts was Christ did what he did out of obedience. When truly Adam did what he did out of disobedience. But we see the one act of Christ taking into him the sin of humanity, something that would be upon him and be separated from God for the sins of the world. And, and that's how we see, and, and the Genesis account talks about, for this cause a man shall leave his father and the end of chapter two, and cleave unto his wife. There'll be one. And Paul, when he teaches that in the New Testament, I think Ephesians, he says, what this great mystery and he's taught, he quotes that scripture, I believe. He says, but I speak of Christ in the church. Paul says, we are united to him. And that's the great mystery, Paul says, that because of what Jesus did, we're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We today as believers are referred to as the body of Christ. And, and Paul speaks about temples of the Holy Spirit. Paul speaks about this act of the Spirit of God dwelling in us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you might prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And you'll notice in that passage, he says, the Spirit of God is in us. And on the earth today, the people of God are joined to Christ. The Spirit of God, the Lord is that Spirit, and when the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. So He's living in us as a people, as a community. And that's a unique thing. Vitally joined together. Okay. So I think today, I think we covered this, I might refer to it as a Sunday sermon. And all of the things that you and I do and the journey that we're on, it's real important. There's a lot of interesting things that people can learn on the journey. But the testimony of Scripture is that Christ died for us. And it's easy to get sidetracked in the journey that people are on. And to, and to forget the significance of that. Need, I'm reading the book of Acts again slowly, and in the Old Testament as well. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Salvation is the Lord. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so maybe today the significant thing, I don't do altar calls per se, but you confess with me even when you hear me say, we confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because repentance is humbling ourselves to receive the message of the cross. Paul told the Corinthians when he was among them, he didn't Paul was an intellectual, and we can certainly see that when we read Paul's letters in the New Testament. But I preached Christ crucified, Paul said. And it was a stumbling block to people that were into wisdom, to Greeks and Jews looking for signs. He says, but I'm preaching this gospel, I'm preaching this cross. And so that's the simple way to put it, is that's the only real solution to the problems of men. And that's why repentance is so important. Because repentance is recognizing that Christ died for us. That Christ died for us. There's some famous songs that say, you know, that reject that. And because you've got to become humble in order to receive that. Okay? So I think we covered, that was the main teaching I, I wanted to do, is by the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. That's called original sin. And that passed upon humanity. So by the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. And to those that receive, in Romans 5, 
those that receive that gift of grace and that gift of righteousness. With the heart we believe in the righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. And whatever community of Christian church that whoever we speak to, we have that common bond, okay? We have that common bond. And I recognize that uh, Christians have, you know, unique differences among them. And as long as we deal with grace with one another, it, the scripture says we contend for the faith that was once given to the saints. I think that's Jude. And so in the beginning of this history that we have with God in the days of Christ, there was the deposit of faith that was made. And some would arise and deny who Jesus was. Some would claim different cults and sects rose up in the first few centuries. But that message, uh, C.S. Lewis, I don't have his book anymore, but it's a classic. I should have kept it, either gave it away, or uh, Mere Christianity. But it just talks about it as how as Christians we're at this common table. And there are common things that we, res we believe as Christians. And it would be a greater benefit. All men will know that we're his disciples if we have love one for another. And, and though we as different Christian groups, different Christian churches, different backgrounds we come from, and, and many of us have particular views of things at certain times, and this has caused divisions, and, and I'm, I'm not saying what views are right or wrong. It's just if we're founded on the gospel, this is the unity. This is where we have unity and the message of the gospel, okay? And this is something that God has given to us, this unity. So we strive for that. And it's on, on, it's on the message of the cross, all right? So let me pray for you guys today. It's the first time we've taught in a while. And uh, I'll post this later. Father, I thank you for all of our friends, for everybody that gets to uh, gather at the table in the different times I post those videos every night and the different teachings I pray most of all that we would be founded on the gospel and that and people would see that Jesus is the only way I'm the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father but by me Amen